All right, here we go. We have one of the most iconic and influential Bay Area artists of all time, E-40. Welcome to Vlad TV. What's up, Vlad? What's handed with you? Thanks for having me, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've been talking about doing this for like, I think, 14 years or something crazy. Many moons, many moons, you know. Many, many, many moons, man. Glad to do this, though. Glad to do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this is our first time really sitting down together yeah. and really going into your whole story. So I want to get into the whole E-40 story. So you grew up in Vallejo, California. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the oldest four, of uh, four kids? Yes. Okay. And out of that, D-Shot is your younger brother. Yes. Uh, Sugar T is your younger sister. And you have two other brothers. Did they end up doing music or not? Uh, so, okay. So what it is is, um, be legit is my cousin. Okay. Right. Uh, t uh, D shot is my my brother. Sugar T is my sister. Then I got Young Muggsy. That's my younger brother. For us, for us, us four. You know what I mean? Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So. You're growing up in, in Vallejo, and um, I guess your mom's from Mississippi? No, nah, my daddy from Mississippi. Ah, okay. Dad's from my Mississippi. From, yeah, my daddy from Mississippi. Uh, my mom, by way of Louisiana, but Vallejo, California. My granddaughter, her dad and, and mom and mama came down and had uh, 11 kids in Vallejo from, mm. from, from Louisiana. Okay. And originally, you were growing up at the Country Club Crest. But then at one point, your parents split up, and then you moved to a different part of town. Yeah, yeah. Um, I stayed on Griffin Drive in the Crest um, back when I was a young man, uh, you know, a young mustache. Uh, I, we, we moved. They divorced when my mom and dad divorced when I was uh, nine, dang near eight and a half, nine years old. Um, and I moved to a whole other side of town called the Hillside. Okay, and what was different about Hillside than Country Club Crest? Well, the hills had more room, like in the backyard. It was like chickens, you know, horses, people, like dudes actually riding down the street with horses. You feel what I'm saying? It had goats, you know what I'm saying? It's like really like, it was, it was it's a trip because it was named after, I guess, Beverly Hills, you know, in and, and, and Southern California, but, you know, it wasn't nowhere near like it. It's, um, it was a lot of hills. You know, just a lot of hills and one long street. The one where I'm from, the busiest street on in that area, Magazine Street. It stretched all the way down there to Glen Cove, uh, all the way down to South Vallejo to some number Boulevard. Okay, and what was Vallejo like? We're talking about the '70s and '80s. Man, you know Vallejo was cool. Vallejo, um, Vallejo was a, a a city where everyone knew each other. You know. Everybody's parents knew each other. You can, you know, typical, you know, borrow sugar from next door, borrow electricity with a long extension cord from next door, that type of stuff. Um, us making a way out of no way, um, you know, me and a lot of other um, youngsters, um, we, we all played sports. We, we love baseball. Vallejo is known for playing baseball back in those days. We, base, baseball was our sport. You know what I mean? Baseball. Um, football, Lemon Street Park, stuff like that, you know what I mean? And basketball, you know. But baseball is, is Vallejo, that's Vallejo's thing right there back in those days. Okay, but, you know, you also have the, the street element of Vallejo. Yeah. Okay. And at one point in the 80s, crack ended up hitting the Bay Area and Vallejo as well. Do you remember the neighborhood starting to change during that time? Oh, definitely, because, you know, when... When 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 Yola came to to the inner city, back then we called it base rock cavities. You know what I mean? We called it base rocks. Then you know what I'm saying. And then at that time it, it was it, you know, um, it was kind of like to me it was when it hit, it fucked shit up too. You know what I mean? It was cool for so, some that you know made a way out of nowhere and was able to pay their bills. It was like I always say it was designed to pay bills and. Even though it wasn't really designed for that, but I'm like, if you, you know, when they was do, when when it was going down, people would, you know, make a profit trying to sell, uh, trying to make pay their bills and, um, you know, and uh, and survive. You know what I'm saying? 
And, you know, things got better and better and, you know, turned into materialistic shit, you know what I'm saying? But then at the same time, it's like it took a lot of uh, honest law-abiding citizens, uh, you know, it took them down, man. They became, you know, uh, dough fiends, uh, drummers, drifters, bass, bass heads, you know what I'm saying? Strawberries, whatever you want to call them at the time, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and you know, I mean, it was to the point where, it was just ugly. It was it was bad because they were really good people, but they they had the monkey on their back. You know they couldn't stop smoking that. Crack. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember I interviewed Freeway Ricky uh, a bunch of times, and, and you know this was one of the biggest coke kingpins on the West Coast, and, and he kind of explained to me how when crack first hit, it wasn't as addictive as people thought it was. Right. Like people would smoke crack on the weekends, then go back and t- to their jobs and their families. And like, like it was nothing. It was just a party drug. But after a couple of years, that's when you started seeing people get more and more addicted, but it kind of crept up on you. It wasn't just like a, okay, I smoke crack and now I'm, I'm in the street. Right. It was a process that sometimes took a couple of years, but once you saw it after a couple of years, the desolation, the, the destruction was just crazy. Um, Definitely. Yeah. It, uh, it, it, um, uh... It did. It did. Um, it it was cold. It was cold because I seen, I seen. You know, I seen to the point where, you know, people I looked up to, from older ladies, men. I see them do some of the craziest shit. You know, I seen older people. You know, uh, you know, shit. You know, get down. You know, for for a rock. You know what I'm saying? Like that kind of shit. You know, you know, dudes that you would think. You know, running off on the plug that that been <laughs> that been going down. You know, you know <laughs> that been going down. You know that was that the the eighties was a the eighties was a fool. Well, you said uh, in one of your interviews, I've always been hood rich, but there's ups and downs because that's the way life goes. So, how much of it did you really dabble in yourself during that time, or were you really just more of like a school kid? <laughs> I wasn't a school kid. I actually was. I, you know, I went to school like everybody else, but I, and I did play the drums. Don't get it fucked up. I was never a square. I like to be a. I was a hip square. Just because I went to college for a year don't mean I'm hella smart and all that shit. I went um, to 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 get away from you know to to. I've always when we was younger, we would always you know go outside of our um, faux blocks. Outside of our city, we would, you know, we hit the freeway. We'd slide out to L.A. You know what I'm saying? You know, we, we, you know, it was bigger. It was bigger places at that time than just the V. So when when Vila was like, you know, we out here during the days of, you know, the glory days, they might call it, and the, you know, the hard headed days when that shit first hit the scene. It's like shit. That's a breath of fresh air, man. You know what I mean? Because on Magazine Street, it was a motherfucking like it was. It was lit all through the through fucking through the night, four a.m. in the morning through fucking twelve at night, like all you know, twenty four seven. It was a, it was a drive through, you know what I mean? Not a, not a drive by, a drive through. Like that's all it was was hella people out, uh, couples arguing and shit. Fuck you, fuck you, motherfucker, bitch. Fuck you, suck my pussy, bitch. Woo, woo, woo. That kind of shit. It was real soil, real talk, and um, and that stretched all the way from. The hillside all the way to South Vallejo to Grant Street, all that shit. That shit all was all lit 24-7. So I'm like, shit, you be just say one day he was going to college, you know, because B smarter than what people think he is. B is very smart, like electronics, all that shit. You know, he's a soil dude, and he's one of the best, one of the best rappers in the game, period. Um, but at the same time, you know, we call ourselves, you know, intelligent hoodlums, you know what I'm saying? Corporate thugs, you know, uh, you know, um, educated hustlers. You feel me? Whatever you want to, you understand me? So it's like when he went to college, I was like, man, I feel like, man, hold on, I need to go too. Right? I said, you ain't finna leave me out here on Magazine Street, man. You feel me? So we went out there, man, and um, you know, we 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 it was a great experience. It taught us how to be men, you know. Um, and we got back and um it was time to get in the studio. Okay. And when you guys went to uh Grambling State University in Louisiana. I guess you formed a group called Intellectual Drifters. Yeah, yeah, we were the Drifters. Me, Waldo Bensworth, and Be Legit. You know, because we used to always say, we used to, look, we used to, you know, we'd be perking, you know, we'd be drinking, perking back then, man. Not perking, said, man, perking, drinking. You know what I'm saying? So we'd be drinking 40s or some 
Wild Irish Rose or some MD 2020 or something. And we'll be like, look at him over there drifting, man. That boy over there drifting, man. You feel me? This before cars are saying they was calling the cars drifting and all. We just like, he over there drifting. So we just called ourselves back then. You see that? Intellectual drifters. You know, just some smart player type motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? Just, just on a good one. So that's what we did. We, we, um, we, we made a, a school alma mater back then. It was called Grandma State University School alma mater and, uh, Killed that shit. Won a couple of talent, won a talent show, signed autographs way back then. It was 86, 87, fall of 86, 87. You know, as soon as we got back, you know what I'm saying? It was it was back to our regular scheduled program. Don't get it fucked up. I ain't I ain't never um, you know, uh been um incarcerated uh for any, convicted for anything or nothing. I have been uh behind bars from um a case number 246, 247. Shooting in the habit dwelling, uh, which I wasn't con convicted for. Um, it was just, you know, he say, she say, but that's that. You know what I'm saying? That was 86, 87, somewhere around there. And then, um, you know, DUIs, a couple of DUIs. I had a DUI in 89. I had a DUI in, um, in 95. After that, I said, fuck that, no more DUIs. But I ain't never been a square. I ain't never been, you know, I just was a, I was just a hustler, just put it that way. You know what I'm saying? And my mind was set on making an honest living. You feel me? Put it that way. Okay, so you guys move back to Vallejo, and then the first group you guys form is MVP, Most Valuable Players. Yeah. Yep, that, and was, that ends up becoming the click. That's right. That's right. So at that time, we, we you know, the, the album that we put out at that time, we knew the stuff that everybody wanted to hear. We just didn't poke it like we should have poked it on that particular EP. So a few months later, I said, you know what? Let's call ourselves the click, man, because we one family, we one big click. And we just start spitting some shit, boy, like shit that rappers is just now saying. Like it was just too much game for the brain. It was nothing playing. You know what I'm saying? And all the real motherfuckers, all the soil cats, you know what I'm saying? They, you know, they they was able to relate to it because they was living that they was living the life that we were spitting, you know. And we would go from uh from soil to soil, whether it was William Land Park, we'd go to Fresno, we'd go to um, Seattle, we'd go to Kansas City, you know. Giving our giving our tapes and CDs and shit like that to anybody that was a fixture, a factor, niggas that has hella slump in their trunk, you know what I'm saying? Like neighborhood and neighborhood uh, heroes, you know, influ influencers of the soil, you know, somebody that you know that uh you know that had a, that that you know they, they that had a voice on 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 their gravel. You feel what I'm saying? We give it to them, and them the one, them the kind of people who who made our music crack, like go crazy. Cause you know, you hear them black, like, what was that, man? This is, this is youngsters out of Vallejo, man. They call it the click, and boy, they go crazy. It's real game involved. You feel me? Okay. So you guys drop your first EP and that's uh, Let's Slide? No, the first EP was, the first EP was MVP, Most Valuable Player, oh, okay. 1988. Okay. Okay. Then after that was under, under the click, it was Let's Slide. And that was that was left side. We had this is the shit that'll fuck with your brain, boy. This is the shit that will drive you insane. It was that, and and then after left side EP, I came with um with Mr. Flamboyant EP. Mm -hmm. We was doing EPs way back then. You feel me? We was doing EPs, double albums, then back to regular albums, then EPs out, double albums, triple albums. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, that's my career right there. I'm all over the place like space. But go ahead. Uh, okay, so you got you drop a uh, Mr. Flamboyant in 1991, and no, no, you know, when Mr. You look Flamboyant. At well, let me tell you what we used to do. We used to put the date up to a year or two every time because at that time we didn't have the internet. We you couldn't just push a button and next thing you know, you are a person has your CD. We knew it took you know 12 months to get probably from Vallejo to, you know, to New York or to, at that time, it was a slow grind. It was, everything was manually done at the time. It was, you know, through, through snail mail. 
You feel what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. that. So Mr. Flamboy came out late 89, 90. Ah, okay. 89. Got it. Now, when you look at some of the earlier stuff before Mr. Flamboyant, um, and you know, Down and Dirty, which was the click album that came out. Down and Dirty, album. Down and Dirty came in ninety. It came, that was the, all of us the click. Down and Dirty, yeah. And Left Side was before that, and in, in, okay. in late eighty nine, mid eighty nine. When you look at like Let's Slide, it seems like you were like rapping more traditionally, and then when you hear like Down and Dirty and Mr. Flamboyant, it seems like that's when you're doing like like the double time and kind of jumping around in terms of your. You know the way you're actually delivering your raps. Uh, so actually, um, it's so it's, it's uh, uh, when I have, it's left side, and then it's called left side, not left slide. But at the same time, I get what you're saying. Um, what it was was um, I was just getting into my my style. I was I was crafting it. I was I was just you know perfecting it. You know what I mean? And then it be I became an expert at it. You know, and um, when I when, during that time, like. In eighty in, in uh, eighty nine, when I did Left Side, it was still different than pe that people heard. It was still different to other people. When I did Mr. Flamboyant, was the sickest shit ever. Mr. Flamboyant, that style was never heard of. Nobody ever did it. it was the throwest shit on earth ever in the planet of in the history of the rap music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nobody was rapping like that before or after. Not like that. Not like that. I was influenced by other rappers as well. I can mix them up if you want me to tell you. If you want me to tell you some of the rappers I was, I was influenced by, I was influenced by Kango from UTFO, Too Short, some brothers out of Richmond named Magic Mike and Calvin T. You understand what I'm saying? Run DMC, LL Cool J, you know, um, Too Short, Freddie B, uh, Ice T. I had a, but I mixed a lot of stuff up and, you know, I was already a, a, um, a, a dude from the soil. And ganged up and, and very creative because I played drums from fourth grade to the twelfth. So I was always into music. You feel what I'm saying? And so I just became something different than anybody that I was influenced by. Yeah, I just it just just became thrown like a frisbee. Okay, so then you dropped Federal, another solo album. I dropped Federal. Yeah, and then I dropped No. I dropped Federal with um. With um, it was it was called Federal, and it has songs like the Drought Season. The first rapper talking about droughts and all that shit, choppers and triple beans and all that shit. And um, I had um, then after that I dropped the EP, which was because because the Federal was an album. Then I dropped another EP, and that was Mr. Flam. I mean that was um the Mailman and and 1993. That was the Mailman. Right, and that was kind of when I got introduced to E Forty. Like I had seen some of the stuff around before, yeah. You know, like at Leopold's and, and, and yeah, so forth in like Berkeley. Leopold, yeah. <laughs> Rainbow Records, but then Leopold, exactly, yeah. right. But then the Mailman, I felt like that was the one that really got you over the top. That was when you started seeing your videos on TV, and um, you know, it had Captain Save a Ho on it. It definitely had kind of slave hole on there. <laughs> you know, which became a recurring character, you know, throughout your career. Yep. And it had uh, Practice Looking Hard on it. Yep, had Practice Looking Hard. Yep, it definitely had Practice Looking Hard. Where you sampled The Coup, another Bay Area. Yeah, uh, my man Boost from The Coup. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, R.I.P. Uh, DJ Pam. You know, I love I love Boost, you know, I love The Coup. Um, that song, um, he had a line where he said, I got a mirror in my pocket and I practice looking hard. So I slowed it up. I told two years ago, I said, man, I want to make it. Because at that time, the reason we said I practice looking hard was because at that time, during that era, we used to mean mug. It wasn't no smiling. That's why I say I'm, uh, I, I smile now, but I used to, you know, I, I say, I say something in reference to that. I smile now, but I used to look mean or some shit, right? Um, but, um, that's because we used to mean mugs. I mean, I feel, I, you know, that's how I know the, 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 um, how these youngsters are. They, you know, when you from the soil, it's like, you know, you just, I used to mean mugs, just innocent people. Just, I didn't do nothing to them. I just mean mug. I'd be at the, I'd be in my cougar burning rubber at every like, hey. side, young, know, sitting hella low, you know what I'm saying? You know, just yoking on them and just burning just, just hella smoke and just, and mean mugs. Like, you know, just however, you know what I'm saying? Just for, for, you know, for nothing. It was just, all right, look. And we, we, I see one of my homies across, we'll be in an intersection. 
He'll be in a motherfucking clean ass, uh, I say, a, you know, a, a Chevy or something. I'll be in a Cougar or a Cutlass. Then we have another homeboy over here. Then we might have somebody from the other side of town. Everybody just mean mugging. Slide out. Everybody on Zenas and Bulls and Planters and, you know what I'm saying? And folks, you know what I'm saying? That's how we used to, that's how I was. It was, it was lit like that when I was, when I was growing up, you know? But I did okay. that. Yeah, but practice looking hard was because of that. That was, it was, it was a reference mm-hmm. to that. And it was like, we had a chip on our shoulder about, we was going through police brutality back then. So it was really a, it was talking about, you know, uh, sicknesses like what's going on now the pandemic you know what i'm saying all that shit and that if you go look at that uh, that's the first day i disp- displayed the broccoli i said got me a baggie full of broccoli and a cricket eyes 22 and i showed the broccoli in my hand that was 1993 well tupac was in that music video tupac came to this video and fuck with us heavy that's right tupac okay shit. everybody every, all the rap all everybody that was that was fucking with us in the bay Everybody drew down the loonies, Spice One, Richie Rich, uh, uh, um, uh, Digital Underground. Everybody that was somebody was in that Viz video. Practice looking hard. Yeah, that was an epic video right there. Right on. Well, how long did you know Tupac before that video? I knew Tupac, well, when he came with Strictly, uh, what, Strictly for my nigga? Or was it Tupac? I think it was strictly for my nigga. He shouted, he shouted the click out. Shout out to E40 in the click. You know what I'm saying? The shit like that. And I was like, damn. Everybody like, man, you know Tupac shouted you, shouted y'all out. I'm like, oh dude, let's know about it. That's cool. You know who and you know who um, actually gave me Pac's um gave me Pac's number was um Double R, Richie Rich. Me and me and Double yeah. R go way back to the 80s. And so basically Double had seen we was at June 16th or something like that, June, Juneteenth. Um, and, uh, it was in, uh, it was in Davis or something like that. Um, and then he said, he said, we, we chopped it up and whatnot. And, uh, he was like, fuck, oh, fuck, I forgot to tell you, man. Uh, Tupac, um, Tupac told me to give you his number. I said, Tupac did? <laughs> like that, right? And he said, he said, yeah. And he gave me his number. I said, good looking now. I said, wow. You know, that meant a lot to me for, uh. You know, Double didn't even have to do that. He could have been a hater and just like, you know, I ain't finna get that nigga, you know what I'm saying? So that was, that was my partner. So it was like, we wasn't on that page like that, you know what I'm saying? And he's still my partner. But Tupac, that's when I started getting close to Pac. I called him, too. I called him. He hit me right. He hit me. When I called him, he didn't know it was me. And I left a message or something. And then he hit me back. And just and he he just, yo, Baldy, it's Tupac. <laughs> Ever since then, we just, we just, we, we didn't stop talking, man. Okay, and that's kind of where the relationship started and started to develop from there. Yeah, like 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 ninety, like late ninety two, probably like ninety two, like ninety two, about ninety two, somewhere around there. So Tupac, he had a court date in um, I think he had a court date in Moran City out here in the Bay Area, and so I told him he said I'm gonna be out there, I'm gonna come to the video. It was either the court date, he had something to do because a couple of times he came, he came to Solano Avenue. And, and, and all his Richmond partners came there. And that's in Millersville. They came to the studio, and he had something to do that day. So anytime he was out here, he would hit me. So he'd say, "Man, I'm gonna be out there. So I'm gonna shoot." I think we we might have scheduled to visit video for practice looking hard around the time that he said he would come. That man really showed up, brother, and ha- hung out with us all day. And apartment complexes and everything like solid. You know, I've interviewed probably more people around Tupac than than anybody, and there's always really crazy Tupac stories that people have that never made the news and never made the headlines and so forth. If you look at like the craziest Tupac story of you guys just hanging out private time, what do you think that is? Hmm. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Tupac came down to Solano Avenue. We all yumpered up, you know what I'm saying? Him, man, man, all, you know, his Richmond folks, they all pull up. They was all in muscle cars. They pull up. And uh, you know how you be when you when you go to another soil and you got partners out there that already you ain't got to fly with no thumpers or nothing. They already have thumpers on. Their partners already have thumpers, you know, thumpers, you know, on deck. That's how you do shit anyway. You're supposed to do it like that. And so he comes through uh, and we, you know, we start writing and we chopping it up. We get, he get his Hennessy. We start drinking and all that. And we 
you know, I think we drinking some Slurricane or some, you know, we all, everybody got big liquor, big broccoli in the air. Uh, Studio Tony had made the blap and uh, Pac seen us, but, you know, we had Mini Max. We had, you understand me, you know, we, we had extendos way back then. You know, we was young, young soil dudes, you feel me? And um, he, he, <laughs> he seen us writing on the flow, right? He say, uh, he say, oh, like that? He look at us. But we had thumpers let's right down the floor and shit like that. Like he looked, he just he pulled out two thumpers, bro, and laid on the and got on the floor and started writing right what he pulled out two thumpers. I put that on everything I love. He pulled out two thumpers and, and start writing on the floor. You know, we had folks on deck on the lookout, everything, you know what I'm saying? We had it comfortable. But you know what I'm saying? I'm just that's just a trick to just, you know, and he wasn't trying to be gangster. He this this time, this is our mentality at the time. We know we play defense. You feel me? And so he was he wasn't gonna be called loose nowhere he went. Okay, so you dropped the mailman, which which blows up, which is at that point the biggest project you've had. And that's when Jive Records started coming around. And I believe it was 1994 you signed a multi-million dollar deal with Jive Records. The first and, and and I remember there was a there was like an album cover. I mean, I'm sorry, like a magazine cover. I forgot whether it was it was a rap page or double Excel. Rap pages. There you go. And it said, was it the six million dollar man or something like it that? It said three million dollar man, but it was worth more <laughs> than that to be over, over the time. You know, yeah, at that yeah. time, I wasn't with it. I, we didn't. I didn't care about advancements. It wasn't about that. I already had Gouda. I already had a house in Rancho Solano, brand spanking new. You know what I'm saying? Lexus this and all of the latest cars and jewelry, Rolexes, all everything that a that a hustler dream of. But it was rap money. You feel me? Because I had independently, I sold a lot of records, more than your favorite rapper did, you know, back then. You just don't, people just didn't, people, I've been around forever, so people don't know my story like that. They don't know. They just think I came out like uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, knowing I've been around for 32 years, been seeing everything that people are just now seeing. Because it's like, I was your age, you ain't never been mine. So I, I know a lot. You feel what I'm saying? I, I don't see everything is recycled. So history repeats itself. Opportunities don't. But yeah, definitely, man. I was we was on the case, bro. We was on the case. I got, I got signed with with uh, it was sick with the records. You know, uh, we brought I brought around brought my family in. We all had hybrid deals. You feel what I'm saying? Uh, Seventy five, twenty five, uh, without without any reserves. That's the catch. They they couldn't help hold no reserves. You know what I'm saying? Because reserves, they can hold 25% of your reserves, and that's for returns and shit like that, which really doesn't even exist anymore in these days because it's all digital, and you know what I'm saying? It's streams. It ain't even so much a digital, it's streams now. You feel me? So you ain't really pressing up. No, you ain't over you ain't over pressing up. There's no damaged goods. You feel what I'm saying? You know, unless you yeah. press up a few, few, few vinyl or you know, just for collector's items or some a few CDs for the energy, because people still do got CD players and shit like that, and they want to collect them and in the South, they got them, you know, and they still got cars where they slap CDs. So it's good to press up a few of them. You, you see what I'm saying? But for the most part, right now, it's streams and, and, and uh, mainly streams, dude. Okay, so you signed this this massive deal with Jive, which is, at that point, one of the biggest deals, period. Definitely. And the next year, you drop your solo album in a major way with the Rolex on the cover. And, you know, me and Richie Rich were talking about this in our interview about how the Rolex presidential is such an iconic Bay Area status symbol. Yeah. You know, that the, you go and even put it on your first album cover, you know, your first major label album cover. First, you know. first major label album cover, yes. Yep, yep, yeah. I have three Rolex presidentials myself in Do all you? the different colors. Yeah. They don't play that, That's out. how, they don't play out. That's yeah. how important it is. Yeah, I have white gold, rose gold, and yellow gold. And they all, it's they just, all keep its value. They keep their value. I keep them, you know, plain Jane. And if I ever want to switch it up. Yeah, uh, in a major way, um, I was, you know, like I say, like today I call myself the curb commentator. You know, that's what I do. I've always told stories and I always, it's just like being in movies. It's just a lot of stuff I really lived and a lot of stuff somebody else might have lived that I'm around or somebody else from a different soil. And so many people can relate in different ways. You feel what I'm saying? So basically, you know, I displayed myself cooking Yola in a gumbo pot with a brick phone and a box of uh, baking soda right there displaying the soil 
how the soil get in. You feel me? And I was inside a Rolex watch, 1995, 25 years ago. You feel what I'm saying? In the ma- doing it in a major way. Okay, and that album had uh, Dusted and Disgusted, which had Tupac on it. That was like your first song together? Um, You know what? Yeah, that was our first song together. Yep, yep. But we had did, when he came to the studio earlier, um, before that, I think, no, that was, that was, that was our, well, we did one with the clip, Studio Tone, I, we, we didn't finish it all the way out. He, of course, he laid his lyrics. Because that's how, he was a quick writer, you know what I'm saying. So I think that was before. I think that was '94 when we did the one with uh, with the click, and uh, but that was our as far as me and just Tupac, me and Tupac, um, and um, Spice One. Um, what else was on there? Cousin Mac, uh, Mac Mall, was Mac, on there. Mac Mac Mall, Spice One, and Richie Rich kind of says a little line on there. Rich was there. Rich said something on there. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. He talked about that in our interview. 40 did uh, Dusted and Disgusted. I remember that. Mm-hmm. And forty and Tupac was on that record. Uh, 40 wanted me on that record. And I told 40 the situation with Jed. So instead of putting 40's record or song in a, a sticky situation, 40 came up with an idea where I would just say a couple words on this one part and not actually do a verse. So I think Spice One was on that record too. It was a big record. And uh, it's a part on there where 40 say, uh, I say, uh, what's the definition of a lick? And then 40 say, taking a shit. And I say, put that on something. He say, I put that on the click, the click. So my voice was on the record, but not enough to really kick up no dust mm-hmm. with Jed. He was actually under, con- he was getting sued by his ex-partner. and Who was? You know, he talked oh, about- uh, Richie Rich? Richie one? Rich. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, by 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 Jed, he was being sued, so he couldn't really do features. But by him just talking on that, he said he kind of got around that. Yeah, no, yeah, because we, you know, we was we were just sitting there just vibing, and uh, Sam Bostic, um and uh, Mike Mike Mosley, Mike kept on Mike brought the beat to him, and he was like, he kept on saying, "You ain't start writing to that thing yet." He said, "You scared of that beat?" Because yeah, I had that beat for a couple of weeks, and he was like, "You scared of it? You scared of it?" And I was like, "No, I ain't. I ain't scared of that beat, <laughs> right?" And that's the way that how we do it. We uh, influence each other by saying it. Like we re- use reverse psychology. Oh man, you ain't finna do that. You scared of that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like that. So he he made me do it. He made me do it, Mike Mosley. And I knocked that shit down. And then that album also had Sprinkle Me, which was like a Bay Area hit. I remember that was getting played all over the place. Yeah, um, Sprinkle Me. Um, uh, Oh my God, that song is so iconic. Like you wouldn't believe the people who love that record. You wouldn't believe the people. You'd be like, man, I remember Sprinkle Me. That was my shit, man. Some people come to me, man, I was a little kid, man. My mama used to play that and I was only four years old. And I'm like, this shit crazy, you know what I'm saying? Now I play it for my kids, you know? So yeah, Sam Bostick and Mike Mosley did that one too. Okay, and uh, that album hit number 13 on the Billboard charts. And without any really huge singles, it goes platinum. Yeah. So you're off to the races at this point. Yes, sir. You now have a platinum album on your major label debut. Yeah. And then eight months later, The Click drops Game Related. We definitely did. And that, and also Selly Sale, um, Killer Cali, which is, I'm talking about just a crevice here away from being a certified gold album, and that was independent. You know what I'm saying? Straight from Vallejo, Selly Sale. Yep, and you know, and, and uh, game related with the click, you know, that's way past gold. That's dang they're knocking on, you know, probably 800 thou wow. You know what I'm saying? Probably 750, yep. 800 thou wow. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Way past and that, gold. And that had Hurricane on it, which is one of your big songs as well. That had Hurricane on it. That had, that had Hurricane. But you can call me Slurricane. <laughs> <laughs> you feel me? That was 1995. And that was, the name of the album was called e, uh, The Click Game Related. Yep. Yeah. And then that same year, the Loonies dropped the I Got Five on It remix. That's right. You remember those With, days? Now? Yep, yep. I was in the Bay during those days. It was the Loonies, you, Drew Down, Shock G. Spice Richie, Rich, Richie Rich, Richie Rich, and Spice One. 
Right. Which, at the end of the day, I would say became the big, the biggest Bay Area song of all time. Um, to me, besides probably, um, let's get it started. Or rank, uh, let's get it started by MC Hammer. That song, I got five on it, is definitely the biggest Bay Area song for us worldwide that you could just sing anywhere on earth. And they're going to all sing to it. I was in Norway and they knew word for word in that, out there in that motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Word for word, I saw that shit. Like, I saw my part. I seen that in all my shows because it's a for show one, you know. And I always shout out because I'm a real one. I always shout out the loonies, yuck and numb. Always do it. Chris Hicks, you know, them all folks. We all go back with this shit. You know what I'm saying? Richie Rich, E40. Spice One, Humpty Hump, aka Shaq G, mm-hmm. <laughs> Captain Sabo. <laughs> Remember you said that? No score, Drew down a yuck mouth, man. Period. And Mike Marshall, man. Yeah. You dig? Like, we basically took a page out of Puff Daddy book. You know what I mean? They just did the flavor of the year. You know what I mean? With uh, Big E, LL, Craig Mack, the remix. Remember the big remix? The Ishes? Yeah. Spootitious. <laughs> Sweetie. Delicious. <laughs> Whatever the fuck that meant. Hell, right. hell. Yeah. What the fuck was that line? I have no idea. What dishes? No dishes. <laughs> Sweetie. Deli- like, what the fuck was he saying? Anyway, that video, bro. We got it from that. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? They did their thing on the East Coast. We like, fuck it. We're going to bring it back together and just do the Bay, though. You know what I mean? Really tap in with the Bay. Not just, you know, get LA and all that. But we wanted to tap in focus on our brothers, the people that we looked up to. In the game, and that's the dudes we looked up to. Spice One, E Forty, uh, Too Short. I mean, not Too Short went on this. We was beefing with them at the time, but if we wasn't beefing, Short would have been on that motherfucker. But just the dudes we looked up to, they paved the way for us. All them dudes, you know what I mean? From from Digital Underground to Spice One, and so on and so on, man. So, so then the next year, 1996, Tupac gets out of prison. He joins Death Row, and then you guys do Ain't Hard to Find. Which is you, Tupac, Be Legit, Richie Rich, and Sibo. And not only is that an iconic song, but All Eyes on Me becomes the biggest album of the era. And Tupac becomes the biggest celebrity on earth. How was that whole process of putting that song together and what was going on around that time? Um during that time we were we were all at the, I believe, the Lamontros Hotel. And um, we were at the Lamontros Hotel, the Hotel in LA. And uh, we was, uh, Pop was eating ribs and he was eating ribs. And we, uh, none of you want ribs, man. We, we, we all get perking and, and shit like that. Big, big broccoli smoke in the air as usual, the, the daily routine. And uh, we all, all of us there. We all at that motherfucker. I'm talking about me, B Legit, D Shot, uh, shit, Mike, Mo- uh, Rick Rock, C Bowl. All of us. We all at the hotel. That's how. That was our spot right there, the Lamatro, back in the days. You know what I'm saying? So it's like we fin- listen. We all finna go to. We already had it planned. We was all going to this, this nudio. You know what I'm saying? So we all went to Can Am, and um. I just remember ordering hella food and shit like that and just hella liquor. And, you know, and that and it's hella different studios in there at the time. So Mike Mosley and them start building one, building a beat, Mike, Mike and Sam. And then Rick Rock down the hall in another studio, down the hall making trade and war stories for Sebo and Pac, right? <laughs> we making, we ain't hard to find. Um, and... It's just Pac was going from studio to studio. He didn't do his verse so quick. He he beat everybody with their verse. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, I write a little slower than everybody else, but I rap fast. So I'm like, man, I gotta take my time. You know, I write fast, so let me hold on now, slow it down, Pepin. Like, I know you got knocked you. So he y'all done yet? Y'all done? Cause nigga, I'm ready to get drunk. Woo, woo, woo. You know, that's how he was always fired up. Nigga, let's go, nigga. Woo, woo, woo. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so. But it just came out beautiful, man. We put it all together. All of us got on that. We, we ain't hard to find. Who's on that? Me, D-Shot. Who's on that? Be Legit. 
Richie, uh, Richie Rich, Richie Rich, Sibo, Sibo. We was all on. He, we, we ain't hard to find. That's you know. That's a beautiful. That's another thing, man. That's what I try to do. I try to include. I try to look out for the Bay Area. That's what Pac was doing. I try, I didn't help the youngsters. You know, people that reached out to me. I fuck with those who fuck with me. I try to help everybody, man. You know what I'm saying? That's what Pac was on. You know, he put us all on there on the most iconic double CD of all times. You know what I'm saying? Like that's one of them ones. You know, and it was just an honor to be on there. You know, and then he also got on my during that same uh was it? yeah, the same year. He got on my album, my million dollar spot on um on the Hall of on the Hall of Game album. Mm-hmm. Me and him, my, my million dollar spot, bro. Okay. But then a few months later, after doing All Eyes on Me, Tupac gets killed in Vegas. Um, so um when that ha- uh so um it came he came uh, he was on the Hall of Game album when I was just mentioning, right? And he we had the million dollar spot and uh on there and I also had a song with me and Too Short and KC of Jodeci called Rapper's Ball. Mm-hmm. A lot of people call it players ball, but it was rapper's ball. Cause we was like, we said, okay, we're gonna say players ball. We're gonna say rapper's ball, because rappers do ball, right? And so um I'm, just speaking of that song, I just want to say something, I'm gonna get to the to the rest to the to the to the to the, to the rest of the part. Um so it's a trip because rapper's ball, this is how influential. People like myself and Too Short and, and the Bay is to the rest of the world. And this is no diss or nothing. We are, we we contribute so much to hip hop that uh, they just, we just, we'll never get our props. Only the real gonna know. And it's it's up to me to take a platform like this, Vlad, to speak on it. Uh, uh, off the heezy for sheezy, too sheezy, I thought you theezy. That all come from a song. It come from the streets. No particular rapper now. Not no, not a particular rapper. Now rappers have said it. My boy Tweezy, first time I heard it was my boy twice, and then my boy, and then Bart from Three Times Crazy, he corrected me on saying it, and that from there, because I was saying for Shizzy, right? So then I had the word down packed by then. Then we hear a couple of my other partners from the town screaming it. Then one of my my uh, my, my Frisco folks screaming it. Then it started, you know, words circulate around the soils. So in the Bay, you know, we all kind of speak the same language. I'm just a little different with mine. I'm I'm throwing like a frisbee, you know. My 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 uh you know my cheese been slid off my cracker, you know, my elevator don't go all the way to the top. I'm a couple of tacos short of a combination. You know, I'm throwing like a frisbee, right? <laughs> so I'm different, but I'm soil, right? So check gang. So anyway, to make a long story short and a true story long, um rapper's bar at the beginning of that motherfucker, shout out to Ann Banks because he killed that beat. Um we just uh, too short, just too sheezy. I say no. He, I say too sheezy. He say he feezy. We off the heezy for sheezy, my neezy. Off the heezy. I thought you feezy. Now listen, this is the part that get me, bro. Do you know how many iconic, um, legendary artists, R and B and rap that has? Maybe they don't know, but maybe they do. But it don't matter. I'm. I love it. Do you know how many words and everything? And how many they didn't make their names off that word? Like that saying, like you got, say for instance, you know the, the legendary trap rapper Young Jeezy. You know what I'm saying? Jeezy. You got, you got, you know, Lil Wayne, Lil Weezy. You got Dr- Drake, Dreezy. You got Chris Breezy. You got, you got Kanye Yeezy. This man named his shoes Yeezy. Now, would his name, would the shoes be named that? If it wasn't for that particular song that we displayed that particular phrase on, it's beautiful. I am not complaining. I'm not the mad rapper. I am very comfortable with my life. I'm thankful for everything. I'm just saying it's beautiful to be part of hip hop. So, with that being said, at the rapper's ball video, two, uh, Tupac was there, right? So, me, Too Short, Tupac, Ice T, Aunt Banks, Richie Rich, The Click. Um, Mac 10. Um, uh, shoot, who else was in that motherfucker? Uh, just uh, KC, KC of Jodeci. Um, uh, so me and Pac, we all on the trailer and we kicking it. 
right? You know, big production back then. Feel me? Big production. You know, we in Calabasas. He was like, he was like, he said, Fo. He said, I gotta um, he said, I said, how you get here that quick? And I just talked to him. He said, my house right around the corner. <laughs> That's what he said to me. Yeah, he had just got a house in Calabasas, right? So he pulled up. You know, we get right, you know, like we always do. He start playing. His he say we just chopping it up. He say, he say, I say, uh, yeah. He say, uh, he say, yeah, I got a I got a new name. I got a new name. I'm calling myself Machiavelli. And I was Machiavelli. At first I didn't know what he meant. I just like, I'm like, that's a trip. My father's a really. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's like, well, he said, I'm yeah, Machiavelli, man. And uh he said, you know, it's, and he says it's deep. He is deep. When I found out what it meant and everything, what it was about, you know, it was like, I say, this dude was way ahead of his time. You know what I'm saying? And then he was telling me how he had albums that, you know, before he, you know, that he already had, you know, just in case, you know, I'm not, he didn't do it just because he died. He just saying, he just stayed at the time it puzzled me because I'm like, damn, I hope my dude ain't finna, you know what I'm saying? He, he, he ain't got nothing on his mind. Like he, he, he finna leave anytime soon. And he, but he wasn't, he didn't look sad. He was like, you know, he just loved to make music. That's why his lyrics, that's why his, 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 uh, his music lasted so long after his passing. Because all he did was stay in the studio nonstop and make so many records. And he, all he was doing was building up a catalog and putting them in a vault. Because that's what, you know, it's therapeutic and healing to us when we go in the studio and make music. It keeps us out of trouble. It doesn't say what we want to say. It creates revenue. You know, the whole who why. So, you know, basically, that day, we kicked it so heavy, bro. You can find him in the video, rapper's ball, shooting pool and all that. You know, a few months later, I get a phone call. They said, man, Tupac been shot in Vegas. My heart dropped. I'm like, what? What you mean? What happened? Woo, 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 woo. I didn't know it was that severe that he got shot. Because, you know, he had got shot before and, you know, survived. Pretty tough dude, right? You know? And to this day, I want to tell you this. I really feel like this. If he wanted to live, he could have lived. But he would have sold his soul. He didn't. He wasn't gonna sell it. Sell his soul. God say, "You can come with me. I can let you live." He's gone with the devil. You know what I'm saying? That man went up there. To, he he went up to. He went up there. You know, with the with the with, with the rest of the talent, man. You know, with the rest of the good people, man. So when he did, I managed you and he showed himself up there with Red Fox and all them and whoever else. You know what I'm saying? With the rest of the stars up in heaven. That's Pac, buddy, because he knew the Lord. He knew he had to repent. You have to repent. You have to. That's why you're supposed to repent daily. You know what I'm saying? No matter what. So I just wanted to put that in the air where it's fair. Yeah, I mean, such a such a loss with Tupac passing. Uh, so so young, so much work under his belt by 25 years old. And you know, imagine if Tupac was alive today, like how he'd be influential in politics, uh, how he, he probably would be the first hip hop billionaire uh, by this time. You know, before everyone else. That's very um, true. Yeah, I mean, very, very sad. Yeah, you let you let you let some of these motherfuckers tell it. He would they they didn't know his vision. He I remember um, you know, um, he was like 40. Oh, you know, we were talking, and then he just uh, oh 40, 40, before we get off the phone, I meant to tell you. He say, um, he say, Man, look, you know how they got uh Planet Hollywood? He said, I wanna do, I wanna do the same kind of concept, but I wanna call it gangster cafe. You might want to, you understand me, put your bid in. You you might want to, you know, you might want to invest in this. I'm going to get all of, all the people I fuck with, and I want it to be called Gangster Cafe. We have pictures of Al Capone, you know, all the gangsters, Lucky Luciano, like, you know what I'm saying, Gotti, whoever, you know what I'm saying? Whoever was gangster at the time, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that was one of his visions. And, that, and, you know, I can see that happening, you know, I can I can see that, you know. Um, um who wouldn't want to come to Gangster Cafe, you know, with some good food? I mean, the Planet Hollywood uh, at that time, the way they formatted this stuff, you know, that was Pac's vision, one of his visions. You know, he's, he's very smart. And he'd be front line right now. He'd be front, he'd be front line during these protests. Oh, my God. Come on, man. You know what he stood for, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I interviewed... Uh, Chris Carroll, who was the first responder that showed up at the scene in Las Vegas after he got shot. And he was trying to get Pac to, 
to confess who who, sh- who shot him to try to you know get a something called a death confession and when Pac realized that he was talking to the police you know he was all bloody you know blood covering his jewels and everything else like that he looked at the cop and said fuck you and then he slipped into a coma and that was the last thing he ever said so Pac's last words were fuck the police I looked at him once again I said what happened who did this who shot you and now he's looking at me so we're looking at each other in the eyes and this is kind of the first time he's even acknowledging my presence and uh he looked at me and I could tell he was, you know, he was getting a breath together to tell me and he looked me right in the eyes and we looked at each other and he said, fuck you. And he said it just like that with the emphasis on that F to, you know, to really let me know uh, that's how we felt. So that's, that's how serious Pac lived his life. It wasn't just a rap. He was, he was about his people, man. He was serious about his people and he talked out about it. You know, he loved his people and he was real. He was real, man, ahead of his time. 25 years old, did so much in so little time. And you, you know, some of these people just don't realize all the stuff he did, man. The man was in movies and stuff. You know, he wrote poetry. He did, he, sp- he, he spoke for, for the people. He spoke for the soil. The, the females loved him. And I ain't talking about just as a sex symbol or whatever, just because he was a great rapper, they, uh, you know, because of status. No, he spoke to them too. Dear mama, Brenda's got a baby, so on and so forth, man. You feel me? Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. The GOAT. Yeah, I mean, he is. The, the GOAT, which is why to this oh. day, you know, you can't make a, a top five list without putting Tupac on top somewhere there. Come on, that's real spirit. Yeah. If, you don't, if you don't put him in there, you just a straight up, Hater with a voltage regulator. Okay, so then in 1998, you dropped the Element of Surprise, which was a, a double album. Uh, that goes gold. And the next year, you drop another album, Charlie Hustle, Charlie, the, the Charlie Blueprint Hustle? of a Self Made Millionaire. Yeah, Charlie, Charlie Hustle, Hustle yeah. the Blueprint of a Self Made Millionaire. Yeah. You know, and this is something we've discussed a lot uh, on my show. You know, a lot of people say money doesn't make you happy. Uh, I personally say it does. Definitely it does. does. Yeah. Definitely does. Oh, yeah. Make your life much more comfortable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyone who says money doesn't make you happy hasn't made enough money yet. That's right. <laughs> and anybody who can count every dollar that they got ain't wealthy yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then once again, the next year, I mean, cause you're just dropping albums pretty much every year. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, like it's 2020 and you're doing mixtapes, but these are actually full albums. Right. These are and, albums. and this never is, a, and this is 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. And I never did a mixtape in my life. I must, I'm, I gotta let you know ever in my life. Right. Ever, ever, ever. There you go. No disrespect to no one. Has there you go. Mm-hmm. So then the next year you drop loyalty and betrayal and that had a na 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 with Nate Dogg which is, I think, one of your best songs. Thank you. R.I.P. Nate Dogg, the great. Just imagine if he was alive. Woo! Oh, Woo! Yeah. Ahead of his time. Oh, yeah. Anyone who's singing some gangster shit right now, whether it's Lil Baby or, uh, you know, whoever else in that genre really needs to to bow down to Nate Dogg, who started that whole, that whole thing, period. Nobody does it better. Come on. Nate Dogg, man. Come on, my dog. And what people don't know, Nate Dogg was a rapping motherfucker. He rapped on my song. I had a song called Sinister Mob. Sinister Mob, right? And he on that motherfucker gassing, but it's a different way of gassing. It's beyond the ever heard of. And he doing the hook. And it's called Sinister Mob. Y'all make sure y'all check that out. It was on my album, um, but a lo- loyalty and be- loyal- loyalty and betrayal. But that's going to come up next. Two thousand was that two thousand when I did loyalty and betrayal? Uh that was two thousand, right? That's the album that the Nate Dogg is on. Yeah, loyalty and betrayal. I think was he on that one? He was on that one, and was that with Nana on there? Mm-hmm. Right. But that had to be both. That that had to be. He was on two albums. He was on two songs with me then on that because I think that was. I think he was on that one with a song called Sinister Mob. That was first motherfucker talking about all that mob shit, mob music and all that shit and 
you know, mobbing and you know what I'm saying? Like, nigga was called Sinister Mob, nigga. Come on. That's yep, sinister. yep. He's on he, Sinister Mob is on Loyalty and Betrayal also. Come on, so, yeah. man. There's too much game involved. Too much game. I ain't trying to, you understand me, uh, you know, stroke my own ego, but shit, man. Sometimes you got to speak out, man. You know, pat yourself on the back. That's all. I'm very humble. People yep. say, Foley, speak out, man. Speak out more, man. Start letting them, man, I'm, I'm humble, man. You know. Game recognized game, but nowadays so so many game goofies they don't recognize the shit. So it's like I'm to the point where I'm gonna start just speaking out. Fuck it, like damn man, I'm, I don't want to be trying to put people on blast or nothing. Cause I that ain't I ain't that type of dude. I don't troll. I don't do none of that. I stay within my envelope. I don't bother nobody. I just get money, take care of my family, and stay and be, and, and, and continue to trying to stay being innovator, man. You feel me? That's what that is. Well, the next the next year you drop the clicks. Final album, Money and Muscle. Not our final, just our last album. <laughs> our last album. That we had did. We got to get back yeah. in there and knock some shit out. It's so easy nowadays. Right. Go ahead, go ahead, buddy. Yeah, well, at this time, it's the final album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At this time. Okay, yeah. and then, once again, like I talk about every year, you do Grit and Grind in 2002, and then Breaking News in 2003. Definitely. Rip back, right back. Never stop. Now, I, I got to tell you, so... You know, they say, what was water at during the drought? I'm going to say a drought because um, this, the, this, the audiences, they kind of shifted uh, between, after Pac died, 90, around 97, 96, Pac died in 96. Right after that, shit started going towards the South. You know, you had the South really doing their thing. And they was already doing their thing. Don't get it fucked up. I've been fucking with the South for years. I was fucking with Rap a Lot, uh, Swab House, uh, No Limit, uh, Birdman, and before anybody. You feel me? Before any West Coast, I'm a I'm a country city boy. You feel me? So basically, what I'm saying is, the the attention was mostly over there, and not after Pop died. Okay, I held on like a hubcap in the fast lane. Stay stay fucking with them. Still do to this day, and uh, continue to put out music. Um, then. Um, in between that, on my album, was it uh, Low Team Betrayal? No, uh, it was, was it Grit and Grind where I had Rep Your City? Look and see if it had Rep Your City. And what year was that? Uh, let's look it up right now. See, this is how you know you got to carry on when you got to go, you forget shit. You, you know, it's been too long. Uh, yeah, it. Rep Your City was on Grit and Grind. That was who, who, Pablo. Tell us, who on it? Who on it? Who on it? PD pa Pablo, Bun B, 8 Ball, and Lil John and the Eastside Boys. What year was that? This was 2002. 2002. 18 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Come on. And that song was a big smash. That was that song, it it might not have been popping on the West Coast, but in the South and the Midwest, it was fucking around. You feel what I'm saying? With that being said, um, I also had a song that was going crazy out here called Mustard and Mayonnaise. The soil was fucking with it. Mustard and mayonnaise, tennis shoes, low on heart, problem with rushes, 22s, big bread, big spread, big scratch. You know what I'm saying? Like going crazy. You feel me? Well, then in 2004, Mac Dre gets killed in Kansas City. Leading up to that, Mac Dre was making noise in Vallejo. The, you know, Fizz Entertainment and his whole clique. Was, was very different than what E-40 was doing. He had his own kind of original thing and, and people were fucking with it. It was a very slow buildup because I remember, you know, when Mac Dre first dropped his first album, you know, I think it was What's Really Going On. It, it wasn't that big, but things started to kind of build up. Before before uh, Mac Dre got murdered, did you guys have any sort of relationship or no? Uh, actually, it wasn't a, a relationship. We didn't have any problems with each other. We were in the midst of being grown ass men um, trying to do like a Vallejo compilation and put some shit together. You know what I'm saying? And this is the honest to God truth. People try to make certain people because they fucking fell off. They want to say certain shit about, um, E40 and Mac Dre. Like we was, like we would, like we were the worst. I never had a problem with Mac Dre. It was, let me break this shit down right quick. I've always been a fixture, like very popular, no matter if it was sports, you know, when I came out my shell, uh, when I say out my shell, it's like just just became knowing who I am. You know what I'm saying? 
you know, 13 years old after after Little League. I was a whole different person, you know. I, I you know, fucking around in in Oakland out there every summer and during the weekends with my cousin now and the Doves and you know, all throughout that soil. I I was I was a whole nother um, person, you know, Richmond. You know what I'm saying? Like they were ahead of time. They were ahead of us. So I, I, I learned a lot. So basically, I was always a fixture. So know this, um, w- with with um, with the whole uh, Mac Dre situation and everything, brother. That man, he was younger than me. He was not like I never looked at him like he's competition. That was never me. He, I don't think he ever looked at me like I was competition because we it, the, the issue was never me and him. Um, you know, this dude doing his thing, like I say, over there on the, in the crest, he had too hard for the radio, which was a slap. You can't deny that. Young Black Brother Records doing it. Kyrie, Studio Tone, uh, did the beat first, and then Kyrie revamped it and did it. You know what I'm saying? Killed it, did his thing. And they had so many, so, so many other songs, but that was his flagship song, Too Hard for the Radio, and my flagship song was Mr. Flamboyant. You know? Cats from his soil um, got a hold of Mr. Flamboyant and was slapping the shit out that motherfucker. Like <laughs> some of the OGs, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and uh, you know, and that was their song. They helped break that song for me. So anyway, make a long story short. Um, let me let me watch all my words so I can make sure everyone don't get this shit fucked up because Mac Dre was an iconic Bay Area rapper. Um, that uh, I refuse to disrespect. That's why I never really speak on none of this shit because it's n- really not him. It's other motherfuckers that try to blow this shit up like me and him had funk on site like fuck him for fucking 45. It was never none of that shit. We didn't have nothing to be mad at each other fucking for. You know what I'm saying? So, um, um, you know, sometimes you grow up with the same, you end up uh, getting into some funk with the people you really grew, you grew up with as a kid, and that's every city is like that. Like somehow, some way, it happens like that. So my brother D shot. This is the '80s now. We already in the hillside. Um, ha, uh, was uh, you know, at that time he was a young mustache, having his money, you know, and uh, flying Boston, you know what I'm saying, and uh. Just like everybody else in the V, um, a brawl that was messing with one of the cats that we grew up with from the crest, not Mac Dre. Mac Dre was young at this time, a youngsters. You know what I'm saying? Not Mac Dre, you know. Um, so these dudes, the dude addresses it to D Shot, they find out he probably would have never tripped if it wasn't somebody that he grew up with and a nigga that's having money and like the opposite of not the opposite, but on the opposite other side of town. That you know, you hear about these niggas over here, do you hear about them on their side? So they were somebody on their side as well. And you know, my folks, B Shot in the click and all of us, we somebody on our side of town. So maybe we were somebody else, they feel like probably with the trip, but it was, oh shit, is this nigga you humping, you fucking him? <laughs> and you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it was a bra, she was from Oakland, and she chose up on my brother. She chose, you know, the rules of the game is don't you ain't supposed to go to war with some, a, a bitch that chose up. If 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 you chose up, you know what I'm saying? You're supposed to leave that shit alone. You know what I'm saying? Check check the bitch. Don't check the nigga. You feel me? And so, you know, what you gonna do if uh if a if a woman tell you, nah, we don't we don't I don't fuck with him no more. We've been we've been cracked that off. That's that's over. You know what I'm saying? And that's like kind of classy. We always have been just in life in general. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, he uh so they come address the shit, talking big bronco. Whoop whoop de whoop, they get some type of argument or something to Magazine Street. And uh then I guess one of the OGs that we grew up with, with on Griffin Drive, you know what I'm saying? He came with, you know, his name Bush the Guy. He came with, you know, Bush, Bush has always been a solid dude, someone that everybody like a, you know, it's always good to have a mediator and somebody that everybody look up to, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, on Griffin Drive, we grew up, we, we always looked up to him, you know. He was an OG, and um, so he tried to squash it and they you know, they, they went against the grain. They had they came through that night 
later on that night after arguing on Magazine Street, and I think they got him up. Big Shot kind of, you know, did his job. And we'll, we'll, I'm not for sure on that, so don't quote me on that. I know he didn't lose if they did fight. That's for sure, okay? Now, as far as um, um, the, the, the main issue is, by passing that is, dudes came through, you know what I'm saying, and plucked the house up on Magazine Street while I'm at Grandma College. Um, later on, um, you know, after that, it was ping pong back and forth. You know how that shit go. It was ping pong. That's what the fuck it was. It was ping pong. Luckily, what I love about the whole situation, nobody got killed. Um, later on, if you, you know, as the years go by, we all, all the OGs that we had problems with back then and the, and vice versa, we, we, that shit, we don't, we don't, we're not on that. We was never, we left that alone, you know, a couple years after that. Like, man, this shit, man, let's leave that shit alone. At least in our hearts. And I, and we didn't, we didn't get no flack back from it later on. And then that was old. So then, you know, I had a relative that rapped, um, that made a song about, so here you got, now you got Mac Dre, the young Mac Dre making a song, um, too hard for the radio, had nothing to do with me. We popping. They popping. It's no problem. They beat. Mac Dre came in around 89, I believe. First rapper ever out of Vallejo was uh, Rod Antonym that actually had a CD, Rod Antonym. They had a song called Hubberhead. I think that was 86. Then come in the click, 88. Uh, we wasn't even the click. We was MVP, most valuable players. Then came Mac Dre. Okay. And then came us as, as a click and me as a solo and all that stuff. You feel what I'm saying? But Dre was killing me. He killed it with the Too Hard for the Radio. I was killing it on the soils and throughout the whole Bay, like a lot of Bay Area, not just um, um, I was not just the 707 Santa Rosa and, you know, in uh, Vallejo and, you know, the Valley, the Modesto and so on and so forth. I was like, dude, I was, motherfuckers start fucking with me because I was speaking their language for show for show. The town love me. It's the truth. I'm just telling the truth. The town is Oakland, where the, that's the mecca of the game when it comes to the Bay Area. They the confirmation. Town niggas fucking with it, nigga. We fucking with it. You, feel, you know what I'm saying? So, anyway, Frisco, too. They was fucking with it. And I had so much love because they Mr. Flamboyant. I was like in Vallejo, California, Mr. Flamboyant. Oakland, Mr. Flamboyant. East Paliacos, East Paliacos, Sacramento. Stockton, Pittsburgh, Reno. I was talking about, I was yelling all the soils and shit, you feel me? And they were like, man, that nigga hard. He only spit, he's he yelling us out, but he's spitting that shit, you know? So anyway, uh, we got a relative that made a song about Dre just out of nowhere. We didn't tell him to do it. He just starts, they, you know, in Vallejo, what they do, they sig. Sig and this signifying, they, they, it's like, it's, so other people might call it ranking or talking about each other or whatever, you know, just like, I don't know what, what the other words are. We just call it sigging in Vallejo. That's one of the Vallejo words. All right, they, they, nah, they was sigging and, you know, that shit go went bad. They sigging. That's how, that's regular conversation. You know what I'm saying? Um, so the, he's, he, he made a song about him and, he, and it got, it, it got kind of personal. They kept going back and forth. Then my name pop up in this shit. I'm like, man, I'm like, these young niggas do, they do, they doing their thing. You know, I don't even like it because he just threw a rock at Dre and Dre didn't even do, Dre didn't even start the shit. You know what I'm saying? My relatives started the shit. You know, we didn't tell them to do it. So at some point, it got personal. I had to have us back. And I, the little shit that I said about the shit wasn't even really nothing spectacular. It was just a couple of shit. He said a couple of things. We never made a full song about each other. None of that shit. Dre, talk around, go to jail. Okay? Um, the song that I had at the time that was going crazy was a drought season and stuff like that. He had two uh, um, uh, California live and stuff like that, you know. And, but the thing, the, the bottom line is, me. it was never me and Dre, okay? It was never us. My relative threw a rock at him, you know. And when I say throw a rock, it's like, you know, sit, you know, you know, threw a punch at him for us lyrically. You know what I'm saying? Okay, then um, Dre go to jail. He in there for about six years. 
I've hollered at him through mutual friends during that six years, for sure. Nothing but love. That's why I tell people right now, they say, man, he, Dre, Forty and Dre hated each other. Not nah, them liars. When a motherfucker, when a relative or whoever the fuck it is, when they down in life and they not, they not popping, that's all they had in their life was to just say something about that kind of shit. That was the only way they claim they fame. They got a point. And people believe it because they're your relative. They, they don't have nothing. To, so they were like, man, well, 40, man, 40, woo, woo. I'm the bigger name. Me and Dre, we got the big name. So we gotta, you got to point the finger at somebody, right? Okay. So when Dr if a motherfucker had a song right now that Dre said between 93 when he went to jail to 2004 when that man passed away, I would love for them to bring it out. They never did because it's nothing because Dre wasn't on that page. He was a grown ass man, solid, doing this motherfucking thing and on his way to become even bigger. You feel what I'm saying? So it's fucked up that, you know, you got people, you got square ass motherfuckers out there, you know what I'm saying, that have been giving me a hard time. I mean, you know, you wasn't even on that high speed. Yes, I was. Yes, I was, motherfucker. I ain't never moved out of the bay. You understand me? I got just right to talk about the motherfucking movement because it come from Oakland. He just had his own thing, the Thiz movement. Okay. He did, and he was good at it. And he was a good rapper overall, period. Because I was a fan of Young Black Brothers just as well as he was a fan of Sick With It Records. These are earlier days. You feel what I'm saying? Okay, so basically, let's make a long story short and a short story long, okay? Um, Dre, uh, when he got out, you know, I would talk to him through my brother, uh, Mac and Ass Russ, you feel me? My brother-in-law, you feel me? And Because uh, they was always cool. Him and, they, and his folks, and you know what I'm saying? And, you know, we were trying to put a compilation together, you know. And Dre, when he pe he came to my, matter of fact, 2003, think about this. Come on, man. Would you show up at somebody's video and come hang out with them and drink Hennessy if you didn't like them? Would you? No. Right. Well, he did. He had no problem with me. I had no problem with him. Him, Miami the most, you know what I'm saying? Uh, my, fr my my Frisco folks, Chuck and them, they, came, they was out there. You know what I'm saying? JT, the bigger figure, Yuck Mouth, all of us. We had my video um, in 2003. It was called Quarterbacking with the Clips. You know, e uh, uh, DJ Quick was there, uh, EA Ski, a whole bunch of people. We all hanging out. Dre come through, kicking it. At that time, I would have definitely had him in a video. My man Lenny Bass, which is a great guy, just at that time, uh, directors didn't let um uh didn't want to shoot cameos until the end of the night dre kicking it for a long time you know being very humble chilling not even tripping and uh he had to leave because i think he was on some type of curfew he was on parole something he had to give he, at the time i think he was staying in sacramento so he had to give back but he hung out and i, I was like man and i argue and i argued all day with the director, like, bro, get these people. All my folks is here for cameos. At that time, everybody was doing cameos at the end of the video, period, at night. So you got to wait all fucking day to get a cameo back then. You know what I'm saying? And it shit, that shit pissed me off because Dre would have been in there, you know? So he had to leave. And so, you know, you don't come to a person's video if you don't like them. Later on, I had a show called Efeezy Radio. You feel what I'm saying? On Efeezy Radio, uh, Dre, it was a rumor that he had a uh, OD, which he didn't. And uh, you know, through my mutual friends and you know, and so on and so forth, we got him on the phone on my radio show called Efeezy Radio. I say, "What's up? We got Dre in this motherfucking man. You know what I'm saying, Mac Dre? We walk the woo. You know." He was like, "What's up, forty man? Yeah, man. Nah, man. I'm a." I said, "Let him know you alive, uh, Dre." He just, "Yeah, man. The Mac go hard, man. The, the Mac is alive and well." You know what I'm saying? I say that's good to hear, folks. You know, you know, good to have you on the show. This, that, and the fourth. We did that, you know. Um, and next thing you know, not not right after that, but months later, 2004 come about. They say Dre, uh, they say Dre got got uh got killed in in uh in uh, in, uh Kansas, in Kansas City. So you know, I was already I already had the song um with the Federation hyphy. We had that out. Um, I had a song called Gasoline that the town and all the soils was fucking with. It was me and Turp Talk on the hook. Matter of fact, Turp Talk had did a song. My, my artist, my cousin and my artist, Turf Talk had did a song called Hubba Rock. And I was glad that him and Dre did that. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, and so 
Dre wouldn't have did that if he he fuck with Turf Talk and if he didn't just like me, you know, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't even did that. I don't live under a rock. So I'm I'm with the movement. I the hyphy movement, all that shit, I'm in it. I didn't, I've been doing up tempo slaps and shit. They used to go crazy to my song Gasoline and Mustard and Mayonnaise and Seven Much and all them songs, you know, on the soil organically doing the hypey dance. I didn't grow dreadlocks because of Mac Dre, not because of him. It was just like, I ain't got none but a plan on growing. So I was like, nigga, what if I really did grow some dreadlocks? That'd be a fool. You know what I'm saying? I ain't had no dread. I ain't had no hair since like 85 when I had a long ass perm that I cut on my way to Grandma Deion Davis and, and be legit can tell you that. I cut it because we was on our way to a to Louisiana where I don't know if long hair was cool. You feel me? Because at that time in the 80s, I had one fucking earring in my ear, in my left ear where it belonged at the time. And they, the lady in the lunch line, when I was at Grandma State University, she just she was whispering to the next lady, like, you know, look at that boy here, look at that boy here, look, look at that boy got the earring in his ear. I'm like, damn, bro, that's how it was back then. So I cut my perm. Like, man, I don't want these motherfuckers thinking I'm. You know what I mean? Some different type of dude. You feel me? At that time, I cut that shit. You know. So anyway, to make a long story short, um, you know, I grew, I grew some dreads. I just did it. Everybody in the motherfucking yay area had dreads. So basically, they asked me, um, Lil John. So we ended up doing, um, tell me when to go. Okay, tell me when to go. I've been fucking with Keith for years since he was eighteen. Keep the Sneak was on my album, The Hall of Game. Same album Tupac was on with Million Dollar Spot. Same album, uh, you know, uh, Too Short was on with uh, The Hall of Game. Keep, Keep been my boy. He was, he, you know, Keep, Keep always, me and him made slaps together. Blue jeans and Nikes and all kind of slaps. We didn't, we didn't did it. We worked together for many years. Um, so I'll say, you know, Lil John did the beat. He did a song called Muscle Cars for us. We had Stank on the studio. Right now, I'm in, I'm in Atlanta. Must I mind you, let me, must I remind you guys that I never moved to Atlanta. I was in Atlanta for three weeks. I did a deal for the first time in my life with Lil John and BME Records. Okay? They, they got an Airbnb at the time. I don't know if that was what it was called, but it was an apartment. But three weeks for me to record out there. Me, Cavio, or Measy, you know, um, my cousin Buddha, um, all of us, we was out there, uh, Bosco, shit, hell of us, we just all, you know, all my folks, we all go out there, and uh, and and I knocked my album out, um, I knocked out Ghetto Report Card, I was doing Ghetto Report Card album, which is, uh, the, in the, in the, at that time, and right now, that's my in a major way to the younger generation. Get a report card, spark, revamp the whole motherfucking West Coast. Honestly, just honestly saying it, it really did, sincerely. Um, so basically, what it did, what I did was, um, uh, Lil John would always say, <laughs> he would have it all mapped out. Okay, today, we're going to do nothing with just slow songs about stripping and and, and big heads and strip clubs and shit and pussy and you know little John John crazy right so that's how you do it then Thursday we gonna we gonna do nothing but just just up tempo all up tempo party club bangers right <laughs> so like, okay okay cool little John let's do it so come Thursday right okay little John you know he little John's producer he has a lot to do. People don't realize that Lil John is more than an artist and a DJ. He's a producer, a composer, and a, and a, and a, and a righteous ass, solid ass dude. I love Lil John. Okay, um, so he got the fucking around on the drums, and he came with boom, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. That was muscle car, dumbass slap, right? Before I had the title already, I said I'm gonna call this muscle cars. Okay, so. Then, um, uh, he say, I said, we need to get somebody on here. I said, let me call Keith the Sneak. So I called up Dane Fang. I say, Dane, I need Keith. Can I send this to y'all? What can I send this to you? At? We got this beat, and I want to call it Muscle Cars. I said, where y'all at? He said, we in Atlanta. I said, y'all in Atlanta, my ninja? 
He said, yeah, we in Atlanta. How rare is that? What is, what's the, my bay niggas doing in Atlanta? You feel what I'm saying? So they in Atlanta. I just, wow. I say, man, nigga, we at, they, hey, bro, we at motherfucking stank on, legendary stank only a studio because that's what we would work at. Slide through this motherfucker. Come to pull up, bro. They pulled up. They said, man, we there. Came through. We had big liquor. The whole woo -wop. They heard the beat. Kick this force all cool. Da, 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 da. Bustle cars. You know what I'm saying? We just started going crazy. And I don't know, not on a local newspaper, but I don't try to clean the version coochie. My nigga went up, went on the cut the play. Whatever I whatever I said at that time. You know what I'm saying? Somebody, you know, so anyway, he he laid his vocals, I laid mine. And uh this shit became one of them ones. You know what I'm saying? You got a muscle car, I got a muscle car, you got a muscle car. It, it was one of them ones. Then, right after we made that the same day, this nigga Lil John got to fucking around on the drums and just do the cat, do 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 the cat, do the cat, do 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 the cat. It was the most sickest beat I ever heard. It was tribal. It was like tribal. It was like it was never heard of. No one has ever did no shit like that ever. I'm like, what the fuck? And so then he just. Then he just, what'd he do? Then he just, uh, he put the, uh, he put the dumb, 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 dumb. He put that in there, right? So, wow. So, kicking it, kicking dang, go around the corner and they, they huddled up. <laughs> Let's get the camera. They huddled up and he's like, came back in. They just tell me when they go. Tell me when they're talking to each other. Tell me when they go. Tell me when they go. Tell one, you know what I'm saying? And that's what I added to tell one. Like, no, you know, it became one of them boys. This is the honest God truth how it happened. Okay. And then, so we call it turf talk because on muscle cars, that's another thing. On muscle cars, um, I had sent the song to my cousin Turf Talk. Turf Talk, my favorite rapper, one of my favorite rappers to this day. My blood cousin, love him to death. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he, he killed it. He killed it. He killed muscle cars. Okay? Killed that shit. So then we sent him, tell me when to go. People don't know this. People don't know. I sent him, tell me when to go. Lil John say, go and send it over there to him. Go and send that one to him. Might as well. You know how Lil John be talking, right? So, <laughs> so Turf Talk, I called him. I said, how you doing, fam? What you up to? What you looking like? Over here racking my brain trying to write to this shit. Right? <laughs> He wrote to that shit, killed it. The third verse. I did I did my verse to tell him when to go. Jesus Christ had dress or shake him. I ain't got nothing but playing no go. Keep the sneak. You know what I'm saying? He came through, killed his shit. You know? And then we got turf talk work, vocals in. Gas, right? Lil John came in the room and say, you know what? That's good shit, right? But he said, but listen here. In order to make this song complete. We must do a call and respond. We need to we need to talk about everything that goes on out there in the Bay Area where y'all at. That's what he told me. He said, we're going to take Turf Talk off with us. He did a great job. He said, well, we got him on muscle cars. We got him on that. Right? This, I'm telling you the truth. He said, talk about everything that's going on in the Bay Area. Now, what I've been wrong for saying, if I didn't put, you know, this, you know, I'm talking about everything because they big, big influence on that movement. Like, the, the Bay is, they screaming, it's, it's part of the hyphy movement. You know, I'm, uh, you know, they got the snap movement going on in the South. It's a, I'm still, I'm still in this shit because I never moved out of the Bay. Never. Now, had I just been gone for like two years or something, and even if I wasn't, as much as I contributed to the motherfucking Bay, and my ear is to the motherfucking soil, and I am the Bay. You feel what I'm saying? So why the fuck would I not participate in something that, you know what I'm saying? That is from my soil. I got family in, in high, I got people in Oakland, family in Oakland, Richmond, Frisco, Vallejo, all throughout Northern California, all throughout this shit. So I got just as much right to speak on this shit than anybody else, you know? So I did what I was supposed to do. I included the, uh, this entertainment. I made sure they was in the video, put a big ass thing with Mac Dre at the end. You know what I'm saying? I did everything. I tried to keep it solid, not sound. I did everything I can do. You know. So what? What do? What do you do on that? You just make sure you just 
Make sure you take it nationwide. So it could be so many people ate off that motherfucking movement and then they act now and then they try to and they killed it early. Didn't get mad at LA for getting from turning it into later on into the motherfucking um what you call the jerk movement. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm I tell right. folks, y'all let it go, y'all. That's one thing about Bay. We had the Bay niggas be hating on each other, nigga back and forth, just hating on each other instead of coming together, unity over separation. One man's trash is the next nigga treasure, man. You feel me? Period. It's the next person's treasure. Well, yeah. I mean, because off of the strength of the hyphy movement and Tell Me When to Go, and also kind of the catalog that, that Mac Dre left behind, that's when I made the Ghost Ride the Whip documentary, which which you had a you know a small part in. You know, yeah. part of our interview was in that, uh, and then that led me to doing the American Gangster episode on Mac Dre. And the Rompu gang, right? So you know, I I played my part as a as a Bay Area native yeah. to try to keep it going, but you're right. At one point, it just kind of died out, and you know, the, the jerking movement kind of took over. But that's good. You 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 did that. You know, you because they they represented what they represented. The Rompu role, mm -hmm. the they do they do their thing. I don't have no problem with none. I didn't, bro. All I did was play my position. It's just I've been winning for so motherfucking long. You know, say when I say that, I'm talking about. My music, all that shit. I created so much. I helped. I contributed to the fullest. Don't talk about lingo, because they'll say, "Well, Mac Dre said this." No, that's a Vallejo word. This, that, and the third. Vallejo, we from the same soil. We all say the same shit. You know, um, this right here. I could, I could claim everything. The biggest words in hip hop. You know, I can talk about that slapping and all that shit and going. I can go on forever. If I get to talk about naming all this shit, you know. First rapper talking about Tycoon and all that. I, if I get to screaming all this shit, people will be like, man, fuck you, 40. Man, you think he made up it? I did, bitch. I really did. It's too bad. I've been around. I'm a dinosaur. I've been around. I fucking, I've been around since caveman piss. You feel me? The fuck? 32 years. 88, bitch. What's the fuck? Leave me alone. You know? <laughs> well, uh, tell me when to go showed up on my get a report card. Uh, and you also had uh, you and that featuring T-Pain, and you were one of the first people to actually put T-Pain on a hook. Later on, T-Pain became like the go-to hook guy, you know, before before Future kind of took over, you know, that that kind of lane in a way. But yeah, you were one of the first ones, and that was a, a great song produced by Lil John as well. And uh, my Get A Report card ends up going gold. So you're, you're continuing to just rack up plaques <laughs> one yeah, after another. Definitely. Let, tell you, let me tell you something about this. Um, you're absolutely right, man. Um, um, and shout out to Future. Future's Future's like the OG to the youngsters. You know, he mastered his craft, came different. Mm -hmm. Um, and T Pain is the OG to, to like Future. You know what I'm saying? Like T Pain, yep. you know, he did say him and Akon, they was doing his thing. And T Pain is one of the most talented people on this earth. Like he don't need he doesn't even have um, not to say nobody else needs it, but people would think that T Pain is all he, you know, I've heard people say it that he he can't get out. With his, with, his, with his singing without, you know, having the auto tune. I've seen that man do it. So check this out. Okay. So my man, shout out to my man Al Capone. Shout out to my man Maurice. Uh, at the time, he was freelance writer for Rolling Out Magazine. We are all in the studio at Stankonia Studio. Uh, Little John produces the beat. Da -da 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 -da. Da -da -da -da. All right. So he like, man, we need to get somebody on this bitch that Ain't too much overexposed, but they do R&B type of hooks. But you know, we need to find that happy medium, <laughs> right? <laughs> so Al Capone say, Al Capone from Memphis, Tennessee, sick with it to this day. That's my loved one. This family affiliated, right? Al Capone say, you know what? Let's try T Pain. And guess what? My boy Maurice was in there. He just, I got a line on him. I just did a write up on him. You feel me? Mm -hmm. I just, what the fuck? I just, wow. He called him. He gave us his number. He called him and he got in contact with him. And then he talked to Lil John some type of way. Next thing you know, we asked him where he at. He say, he say, we thinking he in Tallahassee, Florida, somewhere in Florida. 
guess where he was at? Just like Keisha Sneak. He was in Atlanta. I'm like, man, look at God, man. You know what I'm saying? He come through, man, first thing. I didn't even know T-Pain knew me like this. He just, what's up, Fonzarelli? <laughs> he came in the door and said, damn, bro, I forgot I got a big following in Tallahassee, Florida. They, they fuck with me. You know, real recognized real. You know what I'm saying? And so he just, uh, he say, he say, he say, what it, what it be that? Let's go. So Lil John played the beat. Um, man, man, wasn't the vocal booth. No out tune. Girl, I've been shaking, sticking, more, trying to get to you, that booty, trying to get, real quick, killed it. Then he just put the out tune on that bitch, just tune it a little bit. That's Lil Johnny. I mean, he told Lil John that I'm going, okay, that ain't T-Pain voice, but Lil John, you know, they, they did the shit. Became a slap. Lil John, just, you know, with his mastermind. We need to put a bitch on this. So you want to put a broad on this? Yeah, let's put a broad on this. We already was working with Candy. She was already working with um with the BME click. And and she Candy's a uh, you know, um A plus writer, like amazing. People don't know it's be it's beyond the housewife, Atlanta housewives with her. And she's a beautiful person inside and out. Great, great people. And uh she pulled up. She did the hook. I mean, she did the uh, the bridge. Killed it. Man, that song, that's what I try to tell people. Some people say, why you didn't lead off with that one, bro, on, on Ghetto Report Card? You know, you could have led off with that one. You know, because people don't know that you and that booty so way more than tell me when to go. Didn't have nothing to do with hyphy. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? Didn't have shit to do with the hyphy movement. I have so many motherfucking slaps on there. Yay area, white girl, muscle cars. They might be taping. Uh, give me head. Uh, motherfucking, oh my God. Uh, go hard or go home, which was on the, the, uh, stump the yard soundtrack with Chris Brown gigging and, and all them cats is, uh, Columbus in there with the, in the swimming pool, you know what I'm saying? Like with the empty swimming pool, crumping and all that shit. Come on, man. The shit went crazy, bro. Sick shit. Yeah. Hell of an album. Bro, hell of an album. And then I think right around that time, you get featured on Snap Your Fingers with Lil John uh, and Sean Paul, the Young Bloods. And that, you know, when you look at Spotify, that's actually your biggest song. 90 million views on Spotify alone. Yeah. That was a huge one. And that was, it kind of showed, it was dope because here you have this Bay Area dude. And at the time, snap music was the thing, you know, with D4L and everything. And you jump at like 40 years old from the Bay Area, you jump on one of the biggest snap songs, period. And you kill it. And it becomes a massive song. So I was, you were uh, still in the mix. Still in the mix. I, it's a trip. I think I was 38, 38 or 39, somewhere still. That's still shit. Rounded off to the near. That's 40. Fuck it. You know, that's 40 years yeah. old. You know what I'm saying? But you're right, bro, man. That was a blessing. And then to just be be a part of the snap movement and the high fee movement. And I came out here and did it right. I don't think, you know, you know, no disrespect to nobody else that, that has tried to capture the moment of the uh tell me when to go. But and people that have did it, have did great jobs. Um but that doesn't have nothing to do with them doing a great job. It has something to do with, at that time, this was the energy and the vibe and how much they wanted it to happen. These were, it was organic like the planet. It was everybody from the Bay Area came out. You feel what I'm saying? And we, they, we shot it in West Oakland and all throughout the town. You know, shout out to Beta Weeder and Jay Stalin for take, taking me everywhere where we need to go. Because I'm not from Oakland, I'm from Vallejo. But I fuck with Oakland and I, you know, I done been all through the Oakland soils, but them dudes knew the spots to go do the shit at and they always kept it one thou wild with me. And so we went all around that motherfucker. Bernard Gordy captured the moment, man. You know, and I brought, we brought the whole Bay Area out and that became the most iconic video ever, bro. And, and very influential, you know. So I'm glad to be part of that. Very humble. Glad to be part of it. I showed the late, great Mac Dre at the end and put his folks in the video. Did the best I can do, brother. You know what I'm saying? You know. So that's that, yeah. man. 
Well, I mean, you have like 20 other albums after that, and we could try to go album by album, but we're going to be here for the next six hours. But, but there, but there is a whole bunch of dope albums along the way. Um, you know, I'll just quickly go down the line, you know, to the Wall Street Journal, Revenue Retrieve, and Day Shift, and Night Shift, then Overtime Shift, and Graveyard Shift, and then you did Welcome to the, Se- Welcome to the Soil, which was like six albums deep, and Sharp on All Four Corners, two albums, D-Boy Diary, one and two, The Gift of Gab, uh, Practice Makes Perfect, and so forth. With Golden go Platinum's ahead. in between. Golden Platinum's in with between. With my own solo shit, with, the, with choices going platinum and 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 uh, we out here trying to function, shit like that, like current shit that motherfuckers ain't had gold and platinum songs that come from my era in fucking twenty some years, thirty years, you know what I mean, twenty years. So mm-hmm. I've been, I, you know, and numerous amount of other, and also hella hella features that went platinum that I've been on, and then we can go, you can you can talk about that when you look it up or whatever. It's so too many of them, you know. The right. biggest song of the motherfucker, one of the biggest songs was. Shout out to Big Sean, put me on, uh, you know, I don't fuck with you. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know? Exactly. Come on. Yeah, there's that. And also there's, uh, you know, Catch a Fade with Kendrick Lamar. You got on him early back in 2012. It's, it's you know, uh, automatic with Fabulous. Like, like it's literally, we would be here for the next six hours. Talking yeah, about that's the dope. Yeah, yeah, that was many years ago. Shout out to Fabulous because he was he was down with me. We did that shit. That, was, that went crazy. He shot, we shot that in the town. That's when you can wear different jerseys at the time. We wore different jerseys that whatever match the fit, whatever the fuck you're doing. You know what I'm saying? That's how we did it. But yeah, so many. We can go on and on forever. I, I, I know so much more to talk about. And I'll take up yeah, a whole day uh, with you, Vlad, if you want me to talk yeah. about the history of, uh, you know, of E-40, you know. You know, I just want to shift gears for a second here and talk about that you not only had a million albums, with a ton of gold and platinum plaques, yeah. but you also started doing other businesses. At one point, you started a wing stop. You know, you see, you see other other rappers these days that that have franchises and so forth. But you, I believe, were the first one to start a yeah. wing stop. I was off first with the, with Fat Burger, then the wing. And Fat stop. Burger, Fat Burger as well. Do, do you still own those restaurants or no? No, no. So after you know, in two thousand eight, I was open for three years with the Fat Burger with Chester, uh, with the late Chester McLaughlin, the late great. Chester McLaughlin, R.I.P. Chester, and uh, I send my condolences to him and his, and his uh, to his family and Zena and his kids, and I love them. Uh, and um, also, um, you know, uh, that that went. You know, we had the recession kicked in in '08. We had to let it go. Okay, all right. Um, then, uh, in that same time, I had a wing stop in motion. Uh, you know, had the building in Venetia, California, the same. Um, uh, shopping shopping center is uh, where Rayleigh's is at. Perfect spot. Perfect. Um, had the plans. Went out there to Dallas to the corporate office. Got all that settled in. Um, my guy was a guy by the name of Bruce. Um, that was my point guy out there in, in, tech, in Texas um, for Wingstop. Couldn't, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I had the Gouda, but it was, it would it wouldn't have made good business sense to, you know, spin it on somewhere you know, I got to start thinking, you know, corporate. I had to start thinking corporate because I had already put like six hundred thousand of my own money, you know, I say five fifty of my own money into Fat Burger, along with Chester, you know, to build it out. Because you know, to build shit in California is high. The cost of living in California is high. You know what I'm saying? So you know, I was like, damn, let me go on and do this shit right and try to get a loan. Great credit, everything. Couldn't get along, man. In two thousand seven, two thousand eight, couldn't get along for to build out the the wing stop. Uh, I was so I was caught in a five year lease. So I got a lawyer to get me out of it. So I just went ahead and I settled and paid a certain amount just to get out of that five year lease because I knew I wasn't gonna be able to just. I didn't want to fuck it up and I didn't know how the economy was gonna be. I'm like, man, I might want to just leave it alone right now. Probably tap back in later on or some a few years later or some. But I left it alone. But shout out to those who do have like wing stops and you know other other uh, you know restaurants doing their thing. You know, I uh, God bless me with other things to do and everything. So I'm very grateful. And I've always been you know um, one of those dudes that always you know kept something you know that was very monumental, like the the Ambassadors Lounge back in the days in San Jose, California. 
everybody that was somebody would slide through there every Friday. You know, we would have, you know, celebrities, uh, some of the some of the greats come through there, perform, take care of them. Um, my boy DJ Vaughn over Camiel with DJ every Friday and had that shit cracking. So we had great times there. It was very monumental. You know, niggas that got down in the soils that would kill it would dress up, you know what I'm saying, cleaning the Clorox and come to the ambassador's lounge and knock them a batch or two. You feel me? So I, I'm just glad to, you know, be able to be here many years and still be relevant, current, still on the case, keep my foot on, on their nostril. You feel me? And, um, you know, and I, I remain humble. I'm, I just want to be an innovator, an innovator and a, and a money motivator. An innovator is one that does what everybody else uh, don't. Um, uh, 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 um, an imitator is one that does what everybody else does. And I refuse to be that. That's just not my nature. You know, I grew up playing baseball, watching people like Willie Stargell, the way he used to bat, the late, great Willie Stargell. I used to like watching Kent Kentucky. Kent T Tacovi, I'm sorry, Kent Tacovi, I believe that was his name. He used to throw sideways, play for Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, you know, so I used to watch 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 Rod Carew the way he used to, you know, what I'm saying bat. He was, he was the way he bat. I used to try to I used to try to bat like him. So just anybody that's different, anything that's different, I like. Everybody, a lot of rappers and entertainers like to play it safe, and a lot of fans love for people that play it safe, where it's just you know in the pocket the same particular flow for their whole career. You never know what kind of way E-40 is going to come off on the track or whatever. You just never know because E-40 don't even know. He just listens to the beat. He everywhere all over the place like space. Right. Well, and then and then the liquor started to play a role at one point. And outside of rap, was that your most successful business? Um. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Lucr uh, uh, liquor is a lucrative business, especially when you 100% own it. Mm, which is you. That's Earl Stevens, me. How are you? <laughs> very grateful, I'm thankful, very humble. You know, thank you all my fans that stuck with me all these years. I held on like a hubcap in the fast lane when the West Coast wasn't even popping. That's why I'm still mm -hmm. in this motherfucker. You feel me? Yep. And now you got a new project coming out. Yes, yes. Um, so basically, I dropped, um, I said, you know what, let me, and this is during the pandemic. I'm like, you know what, let me do, um, let me do a series with, uh, you know, of EPs. And I kind of I kind of got it for myself, but also got it from my man Travis over at Strange Music. He was like, you know, cal uh, calculated wise and, uh, you know, and profit wise, it's, it's, it's the lucrative way of going about it. You know what I mean? You know, you drop four or five songs every two months and then you put all those songs on. Um, you do about three of them and then the, on the fourth one. You put all those songs on the fourth one and add about eight or nine songs to it, make it a complete album instead of just EPs. And that's what I'm doing now. So I'm, I just finished number two. I just dropped that. It's called E40, The Curb Commentator Channel 2. That's out right now with songs like Black is Beautiful with, with uh, Big Crit, which is a very uh, beautiful song. You know, um, songs like Goop, you know, which is a, a word in Vallejo that we scream. We've been screaming for many years since I was a teenager. Goop is, uh, you know what I'm saying, uh, you know, um, you know, the shit they, you know, slang on the streets. You feel what I'm saying? And I'm like, you know, I, I got a positive message in there. It's like, you can, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can time and grind for three or four years, you know, but that shit don't add up if you have to do 30 years. You see what I'm saying? This don't add up. So I, I'll, it's always a message to my, to my, to my, to the shit I spit. I'm, I'm a storyteller. I talk about how every soil you funking with people, deaths, you know what I'm saying? And this is every soil. This ain't just, one soil. This is every soil. You end up funking with people you grew up with. The parents know each other. Um, you know, uh, it's and it's and you you all you know each other. Your fellow everybody know each other, and it's just and it, everybody just fall out. It's like it just happens. It's just it's just what it is. And uh, I just I, it, it just it just bothers me. Just life in general um, that life has to be like that. And it's been like that since I was a kid. Like I said, I told you we went through, through some shit that since, that we. We fought with people that we grew up with. Like, bro, we eat spaghetti at each other's house. You know what I'm saying? We back then you could fight. We fight every day as a kid and, and be back friends the next day. You get older, motherfuckers want to shoot up everybody, each other. You feel me? So I just speak real shit, bro. And I'm just a curb commentator. You know, I stay out, I stay out the way of everybody. I'm a married man. You know, I I, I spit real game, you know, 
And what I, and, and no matter what I talk about, realize this. I am a true artist and I'm a storyteller. But me, I'm just a curb commentator, man. You feel me? I give it to him straight, not fake. Hello. Well, E-40, man, 30 years in the game, still relevant to this day. Dozens of gold and platinum plaques for album songs, collaborations, features, uh, countless amounts of words that you've brought into, into the hip hop vocabulary. That's a whole nother um, thing. That's a whole other segment, man. And and you never hear B45 from bankruptcy, you know, or or losing his house in Blackhawk or or you know, uh ripping anybody off, owing somebody money, or so forth. Like just kept it a hundred, stayed a millionaire all these years, you know, just focused on the music, didn't focus on the drama. Uh really a career man that's envious uh of Anyone you you lay out in any genre of music, man, it's Thanks. definitely an honor for us to really do this thing. You I know, appreciate properly. it, man. Thank you for having me on here. You know, it's been a long time coming, me and you, you know what I'm saying, getting on here and really, you know, um, doing something cool, man. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for uh, uh, providing me with this platform to let people know certain things that they don't know. Just know I'm a good guy. People out there, I love y'all. I'm very humble. I know I'm the greatest gang spirit. I'm one of the ones, man. And, Put me, you know, put me up there, man. Don't put me down there, man. You know, at mm -hmm. the end of the day, don't do it after, I get, you know, I'm not trying to dap myself up, but, you know, it don't hurt to, you know, tell a brother, man, I appreciate you. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Because I brought so much to hip hop. We don't want to get into all the stuff I brought to hip hop because, like I said, it's a whole nother segment. Yep. And I guess I get mentioned on the new album as well. <laughs> you know what? You know you got mentioned on another person's song that that, that one of my guys I mentioned you in. Okay. okay. I'll put you on the next one. You know, because you know I got to drop the next one in in, in um in fifty eight days, two two months, every two months. You feel me? That's how I'm dropping. So I'm gonna put Vlad in that one. I chopped it there up. There we with go. Vlad, man, I was glad when I chopped it up with Vlad. Hello. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> E-40, man. Definitely a pleasure and an honor, man. Wish you all the best for you and your family. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. No doubt. Thank Peace. You. Right on.